January 20, 2001, marked the 54th presidential inaugural ceremony and the first of the new millennium. Despite the overcast sky and the threat of rain, thousands of people began to gather at the Capitol and along the parade route to witness this historic occasion. President-elect George W. Bush and his family and Vice President-elect Richard B. Cheney and his family began the day at church. At the Capitol, crowds began to fill the West Front grounds. Over 200,000 people eventually would find space to sit or stand to witness the administration of the oath of office to the 43rd president and to hear President Bush give his inaugural address. The West Front platform began to fill with members from both the House and Senate President-elect Bush's new cabinet, family and friends from both Bush and Cheney, and members of the Supreme Court. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Justice William Rehnquist and the Associate Justices of the United States Supreme Court. The last to enter, escorted by members of the Joint Inaugural Committee, was George W. Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, the President-elect of the United States, George Walker Bush, accompanied by Senator Mitch McConnell, Senator Christopher Dodd, Speaker J. Dennis Hester, Senator Trent Locke, Representative Richard Army, Representative Richard Gephardt, Jim Ziegler, Senate Sergeant at Arms, Bill Withengood, House Sergeant at Arms, and Tamara Somerville, Chief of Staff, Joint Congressional Committee for Inaugural Ceremonies. <laughs> McConnell. Everyone, please be seated so we can begin. Welcome to the 54th inauguration of the President and Vice President of the United States of America. Today we honor the past in commemorating two centuries of inaugurations in Washington, D.C. As well, we embrace the future, this day marking the first inauguration of the 21st century and the new millennium. America has now spanned four centuries, her promise still shining bright, the beginning and present linked by timeless ideals and faith. The enduring strength of our Constitution, which brings us to the west front of the Capitol today, attests to the wisdom of America's founders and the heroism of generations of Americans who fought wars and toiled in peace to preserve this legacy of liberty. In becoming the 43rd President of the United States, 
George W. Bush will assume the sacred trust as guardian of our Constitution. Dick Cheney will be sworn in as our new Vice President. Witnessed by the Congress, Supreme Court, governors, and presidents past, the current president will stand by as the new president peacefully takes office. This is a triumph of our democratic republic, a ceremony befitting a great nation. In his father's stead, the Reverend Franklin Graham is with us today to lead the nation in prayer. Please stand for the invocation. Reverend Graham. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. Yours, O God, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. As President Lincoln once said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended powers to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. O oh Lord, as we come together on this historic and solemn occasion to inaugurate once again a president and vice president, teach us afresh that power, wisdom, and salvation come only from your hand. We pray, O oh Lord, for President-elect George W. Bush and Vice President-elect Richard B. Cheney, to whom you have entrusted leadership of this nation at this moment in history. We pray that you will help them bring our country together so that we may rise above partisan politics and seek the larger vision of your will for our nation. Use them to bring reconciliation between the races, healing to political wounds, that we may truly become one nation under God. Give our new president and all who advise him calmness in the face of storms, encouragement in the face of frustration, and humility in the face of success. Give them the wisdom to know and to do what is right, and the courage to say no to all that is contrary to your statutes and holy law. Lord, we pray for their families, and especially their wives, Laura Bush and Lynn Cheney, that they may sense your presence and know your love. Today, we entrust to you, President and Senator Clinton, and Vice President and Mrs. Gore, lead them as they journey through new doors of opportunity to serve others. Now, O oh Lord, we dedicate this presidential inaugural ceremony to you. May this be the beginning of a new dawn for America as we humble ourselves before you and acknowledge you alone as our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. We pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Graham. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the DuPont Manual Choir of Louisville, Kentucky.
now call on Senator Christopher, Christopher J. Dodd of Connecticut to introduce the Chief Justice of the United States. Thank you, Senator McConnell, President and Senator Clinton, Vice President and Mrs. Gore, President-elect and Mrs. Bush, and fellow citizens. The Vice President-elect will now take the oath of office. His wife, Lynn, and their daughters, Elizabeth Cheney Perry and Mary Cheney, will hold the family Bible. I have the honor and privilege to now present the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable William Hobbs Rehnquist, to administer the oath of office to the Vice President-elect, Richard Bruce Cheney. your right hand and repeat after me. I, Richard Bruce Cheney, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Bruce Cheney, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter the duties of the office on which I am about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations Mr. <laughs> Gentlemen, Staff Sergeant Alec T. Molly of the United States Army Band will now perform an American medley.
It is now my high honor to again present uh, the Chief Justice of the United States, who will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, George W. Bush. Thank you all. Chief Justice Rehnquist, President Carter, President Bush, <laughs> President Clinton, distinguished guests and my fellow citizens. The peaceful transfer of authority is rare in history, yet common in our country. With a simple oath, we affirm old traditions and make new beginnings. As I begin, I thank President Clinton for his service to our nation. And I thank Vice President Gore for a contest conducted with spirit and ended with grace. I am honored and humbled to stand here where so many of America's leaders have come before me, and so many will follow. We have a place, all of us, in a long story, a story we continue, but whose end we will not see. It is a story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of the old, the story of a slaveholding society that became a servant of freedom, the story of a power that went into the world to protect but not possess, to defend but not to conquer. It is the American story, a story of flawed and fallible people united across the generations by grand and enduring ideals. The grandest of these ideals is an unfolding American promise that everyone belongs, that everyone deserves a chance, 
that no insignificant person was ever born. Americans are called to enact this promise in our lives and in our laws. And though our nation has sometimes halted and sometimes delayed, we must follow no other course. Through much of the last century, America's faith in freedom and democracy was a rock in a raging sea. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country. It is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. And even after nearly 225 years, we have a long way yet to travel. While many of our citizens prosper, others doubt the promise, even the justice of our own country. The ambitions of some Americans are limited by failing schools and hidden prejudice and the circumstances of their birth. And sometimes our differences run so deep, it seems we share a continent, but not a country. We do not accept this and we will not allow it. Our unity, our union, is the serious work of leaders and citizens and every generation. And this is my solemn pledge. I will work to build a single nation of justice and opportunity. I know this was in our reach because we are guided by a power larger than ourselves who creates us equal in his image. And we are confident in principles that unite and lead us onward. America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, makes our country more, not less, American. Today, today we affirm a new commitment to live out our nation's promise through civility, courage, compassion, and character. America, at its best, matches a commitment to principle with a concern for civility. A civil society demands from each of us goodwill and respect, fair dealing, and forgiveness. Some seem to believe that our politics can afford to be petty because in a time of peace, the stakes of our debates appear small. But the stakes for America are never small. If our country does not lead the cause of freedom, it will not be led. If we do not turn the hearts of children toward knowledge and character, we will lose their gifts and undermine their idealism. If we permit our economy to drift and decline, the vulnerable will suffer most. We must live up to the calling we share. Civility is not a tactic or a sentiment. It is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos. And this commitment, if we keep it, is a way to shared accomplishment. America at its best is also courageous. Our national courage has been clear in times of depression and war when defeating common dangers defined our common good. Now we must choose if the example of our fathers and mothers will inspire us or condemn us. We must show courage in a time of blessing by confronting problems instead of passing them on to future generations. Together, we will reclaim America's schools before ignorance and apathy claim more young lives. We will reform Social Security and Medicare 
sparing our children from struggles we have the power to prevent. And we will reduce taxes to recover the momentum of our economy and reward the effort and enterprise of working Americans. We will build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. We will confront weapons of mass destruction so that a new century is spared new horrors. The enemies of liberty in our country should make no mistake. America remains engaged in the world by history and by choice, shaping a balance of power that favors freedom. We will defend our allies and our interests. We will show purpose without arrogance. We will meet aggression and bad faith with resolve and strength. And to all nations, we will speak for the values that gave our nation birth. America at its best is compassionate. In the quiet of American conscience, we know that deep, persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's promise. And whatever our views of its cause, we can agree that children at risk are not at fault. Abandonment and abuse are not acts of God. They are failures of love. And the proliferation of prisons, however necessary, is no substitute for hope and order in our souls. Where there is suffering, there is duty. Americans in need are not strangers. They are citizens, not problems, but priorities. And all of us are diminished when any are hopeless. <laughs> Government has great responsibilities for public safety and public health, for civil rights and common schools. Yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And some needs and hurts are so deep, they will only respond to a mentor's touch or a pastor's prayer. Church and charity, synagogue and mosque lend our communities their humanity, and they will have an honored place in our plans and in our laws. Many in our country do not know the pain of poverty, but we can listen to those who do. And I can pledge our nation to a goal. When we see that wounded traveler on the road to Jericho, we will not pass to the other side. America at its best is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Encouraging responsibility is not a search for scapegoats. It is a call to conscience. And though it requires sacrifice, it brings a deeper fulfillment. We find the fullness of life not only in options but in commitments. And we find that children and community are the commitments that set us free. Our public interest depends on private character on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness, on, on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency, which give direction to our freedom. Sometimes in life, we're called to do great things. But as a saint of our times has said, every day we are called to do small things with great love. The most important tasks of a democracy are done by everyone. I will live and lead by these principles to advance my convictions with civility, to pursue the public interest with courage, to speak for greater justice and compassion, to call for responsibility and try to live it as well. In all these day, ways, I will bring the values of our history to the care of our times. What you do is as important as anything government does. 
I ask you to seek a common good beyond your comfort, to defend needed reforms against easy attacks, to serve your nation beginning with your neighbor. I ask you to be citizens, citizens not spectators, citizens not subjects, responsible citizens building communities of service and a nation of character. Americans are generous and strong and decent, not because we believe in ourselves, but because we hold beliefs beyond ourselves. When this spirit of citizenship is missing, no government program can replace it. When this spirit is present, no wrong can stand against it. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, we know the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate, but the themes of this day he would know. Our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. We are not this story's author who fills time and eternity with his purpose. Yet his purpose is achieved in our duty, and our duty is fulfilled in service to one another. Never tiring, never yielding, never finishing, we renew that purpose today to make our country more just and generous to affirm the dignity of our lives and every life. This work continues. The story goes on. And an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. God bless you all, and God bless America. Please stand now as Pastor Kirby John H. Caldwell will now deliver the benediction. And afterward, please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem, after which the ceremony will be concluded. I call upon Senator Dodd to organize the presidential party after the ceremony has ended to depart the platform. Pastor Caldwell. Thank you, Senator McConnell. Let us pray, please. Almighty God, the supply and supplier of peace, prudent policy, and nonpartisanship, we bless your holy and righteous name. Thank you, O oh God, for blessing us with forgiveness, with faith, and with favor. Forgive us for choosing pride over purpose. Forgive us for choosing popularity over principles. And forgive us for choosing materialism over morals. Deliver us from these and all other evils and cast our sins into your sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. And Lord, not only do we thank you for our forgiveness, we thank you for faith. Faith to believe that every child can learn and no child will be left behind and no youth will be left out. Thank you for blessing us with the faith to believe that all of your leaders can sit down and reason with one another so that each American is blessed. Thank you for blessing us with the faith to believe that the walls of inequity can be torn down and the gaps between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the uneducated and the educated 
can and will be closed. And Lord, lastly, we thank you for favor. We thank you for your divine favor. Let your favor be upon President Clinton and the outgoing administration. May they go forth in spiritual grace and civic greatness. And of course, O oh Lord, let your divine favor be upon President George W. Bush and First Lady Laura Welch Bush and their family. We decree and declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Let your divine favor be upon the Bush team and all Americans. With the rising of the sun and the going down of the same, may we grow in our willingness and ability to bless you and bless one another. We respectfully submit this humble prayer in the name that's above all other names, Jesus the Christ. Let all who agree say amen. Under the direction of the Senate Sergeant at Arms, James Ziegler, former President Clinton and his family and Vice President Gore and his family were escorted to the east front of the Capitol. First the Gores, then the Clintons said their farewells.
Due to inclement weather, the helicopter that was to take former President Clinton to his destination remained idle on the East Front, and the former First Family left instead by way of limo from the Capitol building. Meanwhile, President Bush proceeded to his first official responsibility. In the President's room, President Bush signed the first request he would make of the 107th Congress, the nominations of his cabinet. Throughout the 20th century, Congress has hosted an inaugural luncheon following the swearing-in ceremony. Tradition calls for the leaders of both houses of Congress, committee chairmen and their wives, to join the president, vice president, and the new cabinet. Ladies and gentlemen, the vice president of the United States and Mrs. Lynn Cheney accompanied by Senator Dodd and his wife, Jackie Clegg Dodd. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Laura Bush, accompanied by Senator McConnell and his wife, the Secretary-designate of Labor, Ms. Elaine Chow. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, please be seated and enjoy your meal. Uh, at the end of the meal, we'll have a brief program consisting of a toast and some presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, take your seats. So it's been my privilege to, as chairman of the Joint <coughs> Congressional Committee on Inaugural Activities, uh, to toast the newly inaugurated president and vice president. 
We've all heard the famous maxim that history repeats itself. Or as one wag said, history isn't one darn thing after another. It's the same darn thing over and over. Two centuries ago, uh, Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated as president after an extremely close, hard-fought election battle. The nation was divided. Then as now, our nation needed a leader who could heal the divide. President Jefferson beseeched a divided nation to unite with one heart and one mind, reminding supporters and opponents that every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. To bring about that unity of purpose requires a special leader with a special gift. A leader like our new president, who comes as a uniter, someone like Joshua and Caleb, who were chosen to lead the people into the promised land because they exemplified a different spirit. Would you all stand and please raise your glass in a toast? Mr. President, we salute the different spirit you bring to our nation's government, a spirit of unity and respect for all. And we pledge Republicans and Democrats alike that we will make the common effort for the common good. And finally, we ask in the words of President Jefferson that the infinite power which rules the destinies of the universe will lead you to what is best for our nation's peace and prosperity. Starting in 1989, the President and the Vice President have received from the Congress on this day two handcrafted crystal bowls, each resting on a solid leaded crystal base upon which is engraved their name. Each gift weighs 40 pounds. Now, Mr. President, that's nearly as hefty as some appropriation bills we'll be sending your way uh, soon. Uh, for the first time, etched into the crystal bowls are depictions of the Capitol building and the White House in their approximate geographic locations to one another. You'll note, uh, Mr. President and Mr. Vice President, that the White House on these bowls is tiny, almost microscopic in comparison to the Capitol engraving. It is, of course, purely coincidental that the Congress oversaw the design process. Today, we are also doing something else because this is such a unique occasion. We're presenting a third bowl, this one to the 41st President of the United States, the father of our new President. This handcrafted replica signifies a remarkable occasion for a man whose love and pride for his son on this day we can only imagine. I'd like to call on uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Jay Dennis Hastert, who will present flags uh, to the President and to the Vice President. Thank you, Senator. Uh, welcome to this uh, great chamber, once uh, being the, the House of Representatives for almost 50 years of this nation's history, the early history where Congress, the Senate, and the House struggled administration, the White House struggled to find its definitive way of how to form this country. Now we're much more matured as a nation, a nation that uh, today handed over the reins of power 
from one party to another party in peace, tranquility, in a congratulatory manner. The symbol of this great nation, of this place, of the American people, the flag of the United States. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, this morning at dawn, we had two flags raised over the capital of the United States. And it's our great honor to present those to you that were brought down uh, right after the finish of the inauguration. However, I'm not going to hand them to you because they're a little wet. So we're going to properly uh, dry them out and present them, but uh, on behalf of the Congress and behalf of this gathering here, we wish you the best. We know that these flags will be a symbol to this day and a symbol of a great beginning. Thank you very much. God bless you. On behalf of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, it's my honor to present to the President the official inaugural photo and to invite the President at this time to make a few remarks. Senator, thank you very much. I was wondering if I was ever going to have a warm meal during the inaugural ceremonies. <laughs> and so I want to thank you for the food. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Congressman Gephardt and Senator Daschle, thank you all very much for your kind hospitality. President Carter and Mrs. Carter, I'm so honored you all took time out of your lives to come. It means a lot to Laura and me for you to be here. Thank you very much. Mother, I'm glad you came as well. <laughs> I know I can speak on behalf of the Cheneys that Laura and I have really relished this magnificent moment great testimony to our country. It's a testimony to the great land of America to have a sitting outgoing president and an incoming president sit side by side in peaceful transfer of power. I'm not so sure how much of it I'm going to actually remember. It was such a magnificent time for our country and for me. Today is also a testimony to two wonderful parents people who instilled values and gave unconditional love. <laughs> Expectations in the country is we can't get anything done. People say, well, gosh, the election was so close, nothing will happen except for finger pointing and name calling and bitterness. I'm here to tell the country that things will get done, that we're going to rise above expectations, that both Republicans and Democrats will come together to do what's right for America so that when people look at Washington, they say public service is noble. Positive things can happen for the country. There are men and women of good conscience and good heart who are serving this noble nation for the right reasons. Let's let it happen. God bless, and God bless America. Just have your uh, attention for one a minute more. Uh, President Bush and Mrs. Bush and Vice President Cheney, Mrs. Cheney, distinguished colleagues, uh, two presentations, if I could. Uh, first of all, in front of your plates is a little gold box. Now, I've heard about boots and bow ties in Lone Star states and Texas, but there is a Connecticut connection to this Bush family. 
fact, some 47 years ago, um, my father and the President's grandfather ran against each other for the United States Senate. Prescott Bush won that seat, and two years later, my father joined him in the Senate, and they were good friends. Uh, so today, we've given a little gift from Connecticut, and when you get a chance to open it up, it has the, uh, a, a drawing or a, a relief of the capital of the United States, as it was in 1801, which was the first time an inauguration of an American president ever occurred in this building. And uh, in your honor, Mr. President, and Mr. Vice President. And the second um, privilege I have, Mr. Vice President, is to present you as well with a photograph uh, taken just moments ago as you accepted the, uh, the oath of office as Vice President of the United States. And on behalf of all of us here today, we wish you and Mrs. Cheney the very, very best. We look forward to you being in the Senate, but not that frequently, Mr. <laughs> Vice President. Uh, congratulations to you both. Please now to present Pastor Kirby John H. Caldwell to perform the benediction. Pastor Caldwell. Thank you very much. Mr. President, First Lady, Mr. Vice President, Ms. Cheney, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, I, I wish to offer a non-traditional benediction. Accordingly, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> and, and please keep your eyes open. You are a man of vision. The Bible says that without a vision, people perish. This is our benediction. When the historians write about this century, may your leadership be recognized and celebrated as among the most effective, efficient, efficacious, and empowering known to humankind. May God continue to bless you, your family, and this country. That concludes this luncheon. Thank you all very much for being with us. Escorted by General James Jackson, the commanding general of the United States Military District of Washington, President Bush and Vice President Cheney, along with their families, left the Capitol building. On the East Center steps, President Bush stopped to review the military service's honor guards.
Following the review, President Bush and Mrs. Bush were escorted to their limousine and began their trip to the White House to review the parade which would be coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. constitutional requirements for providing a peaceful transition of power and leadership were fulfilled. The Bush administration had officially begun and the nation was ready to celebrate.